Hello, welcome back to Luxor. We are on the West Bank to learn more about Wadi El Menekat, the Valley of the Queens, ancient Egyptian royal necropolis built more than 3500 years ago, intended for burials of royal children and queens. Let's go! Though the place commonly functions under the name of Valley of the Queens, the ancient Egyptians called it Ta Set Neferu, meaning either the place of the royal children or the place of beauty, place of perfection. Today the necropolis features 111 tombs, all constructed during the New Kingdom period. assumed as there is no evidence that the location of the necropolis was purely practical. The vicinity of Workman's village, Der El Medina, and the Valley of the Kings, less than a few kilometers, certainly made the work on the Queen's tombs more effective. Nevertheless, the place isn't completely deprived of magical or religious features. First of all, it lies not far away from the sacred pyramid-shaped hilltop of El Kerna, and even more importantly, at the very entrance to the valley, there is a sacred grotto dedicated to the Mistress of the West, Goddess Hathor, who in ancient Thebes welcomed the deceased in the afterlife. The oldest tomb discovered at the site is believed to be much more than 3,000 years old. It's the tomb QV47, belonging to the Princess Ahmos, sister of the founder of the 18th dynasty. The first tomb we're going to explore, QV55, was constructed during the 20th dynasty in the 12th century BCE. The interior instantly strikes with amazingly preserved wall decorations. This one is nice. The ornamentation in the tomb, though rather simple, mirrors the elegance and stylistic maturity of the late New Kingdom period. The variety of pharaoh's headdresses, like cap crown here, symbolizing connection with Ptah, god of creation, as well as wide range of ceremonial robes, allowed the artists to focus on details, therefore creating one of the 20th dynasty masterpieces. The tomb was constructed for Amun Herhepshef, probably the eldest son of Haramasis III, heir to the throne. Sadly, however, the young prince never became a pharaoh, dying during teenage years. It's estimated that he was less than 16 years old. Although the tomb was built for the prince, it's hard to resist the impression that there is more depictions of Ramesses III than the prince himself. Actually, the main theme throughout the tombs of Ramesses III's children repeats itself. The king is the one on the front, leading his offspring through the underworld and presenting them to the gods.
Though the prince died young, he bore three important titles – cavalry commander, a royal scribe and fun bearer to the right of the king. The last title was usually given to the courtiers and meant a close relationship with the pharaoh, either official or personal. The fun bearers were accompanying the pharaoh during his journeys within Egypt and campaigns outside of it. It seems that Amun Herhebshev was spending a lot of time with his father, preparing for his future role. We're entering the burial chamber. There's a granite sarcophagus which, first of all, was originally found in the preceding corridor and moved to the chamber to make more space for excavations. Secondly, as you can see, it was never finished and thirdly, was most probably never used. It's believed that Amun Herhebshev was interred in the Valley of the Kings, in the sarcophagus originally belonging to the female pharaoh Tausert but had been altered to match the prince. To make it even more complicated, it was found in Kavi 13, in the tomb of Chancellor Bey. I mentioned him in the episode about the 19th dynasty linked down in the description. This whole charade might have resulted from the fact that around the time of the prince's death, the workers of the Real Medina were rioting, and the Valley of the Kings was the safest necropolis at that time. The king with his kid passes through the gates of the underworld by the aid of magic spells. As this longitudinal chamber depicts fragments from chapters 145 and 146 from the Book of the Dead, there are four quite terrifying guardians of the gates armed with knives. We've just seen one with a vulture head. There's also Semati with the ram's head. And Hanebreku, a black dog-headed creature. They protect gates 5 to 8 and their titles read Killer of Opponents, Destroyer, Ikenti, and protector of his Osiris body. Apart from one scene in the tomb where the prince is presented wearing a leopard skin, he always holds a lavish fan of feathers, a flabellum, used to pay homage to the gods. An example of flabellum was found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. Interestingly, the flabella became popular among the Christians and were used until around the 14th century AD. Now you can see many representations of the prince with a flabellum in his hand. Inside the tomb placed in the glass box there is a mummified fetus. It was found in the tomb of Prince Ahmos QV88, located in the southern subsidiary valley. The little one was found in a wooden box wrapped with linen. According to the members of the discovery mission, a perfume oil was sprinkled over the mummy and the wrappings were made of a high-quality linen, but his or her identity remains a mystery. The wooden case with its quite surprising contents was excavated at the very beginning of the 20th century, between 1903 and 1906, by the Italian team led by Ernesto Schiaparelli. He was the first one to conduct the works on the site. He not only discovered 13 tombs in the Valley of the Queens, and among them one of the most popular Egyptian tombs, QV66, the tomb of Queen Nefertari, but more importantly, he took 135 photographs of the interior, recording Nefertari's tomb condition and ornamentation. 
a priceless source of information for us and many future generations. All tombs we're going to see today were discovered by Schiaparelli and his team. The site contains dozens of 18 dynasty tombs with vertical shafts and one chamber. Sadly, they're all closed for visitors. The next tomb, QV44, also belongs to one of the sons of Ramesses III. Hamwasad bore three main titles, the king's son, the king's first son of his body, which could be understood both ways. He was either firstborn of one of the king's wives, or at some point of his life was a contender to the throne because of his elder sibling's death. But he never became a pharaoh. Hamwasad's third title was the priest of Ptah, and this was his lifelong position and occupation. Although the scenes depicted on the walls of the main axis of the tomb are similar to those from Amun Rehebshev's, Ramesses in the focal point, accompanied by the gods with the prince behind him, the decoration in the two small annexes puts the deceased in the center of attention. He is worshipping here four sons of Horus, personifications of the canopic jaws, in which four main organs were stored. A dog-like creature, Duamutev, protected the stomach, a falcon, the intestines, a baboon, the lungs, and a human, the liver. The annexes also display the ibis-headed god of wisdom, Thoth, and goddesses Isis and Nephthys. The decoration in the tomb is as wonderfully executed and excellently preserved as in the previous tomb. Sunken reliefs on the plastered walls still display a riot of original colors. The decoration of the burial chamber is a continuation of the journey through the underworld from the tomb of Amun Herhebshev. There we had gates 5 to 8, here 9 to 16, along with their guardians, like this cat like demon Mew, protector of the 12th gate. And the Dikesu Udenbega Peremut, he who provokes weakness and emerges as death, always weirdly presented from behind, protector of the 16th gate. Ramesses built five tombs for his offspring during the 28th year of his reign, QV 42, 43, 44, 53 and 55. QV 53, the tomb of Ramesses Meriam and later Pharaoh Ramesses IV, depicts the four gates of the underworld and their guardians, but the scenes depicting the last gates, 17 to 21, have never been discovered, which led scholars to believe that they had been planned for one of the unfinished tombs. beautifully painted winged disc on the entrance to the site annex. We've seen a similar one in the previous tomb. Initially, the falcon wings symbolized heaven. During the Old Kingdom, about the 5th dynasty, the sun disc, Behdeti, symbol of Horus, was added, as well as two cobras, symbols of divine royalty. Since then, the sign became Horus Behdeti, he 
of the colorful feathers. However, as one might think, taking into consideration Hemwaset's royal background, he wasn't a high priest, but a Sem priest, responsible for the funerary rites. Sem priests were the embalmers, mummifying the body and reciting the spells during the mummification process. The Sem priests were respected and well regarded, because they were responsible for the precise utterance of the incantations, which would guarantee eternal life to the deceased. I think I haven't been in any tomb yet which would display the clothing and its details like these two in the Valley of the Queens. Although the pharaoh or the prince wore from time to time taboo materials like pelts or skins of lion or leopard, all Egyptians, regardless of their social status, wore linen clothes made of flax, cultivated along the Nile. Obviously, the material prepared for the royalty was of the best quality, loosely woven, often almost see-through-like. During the New Kingdom period, the most fashionable were pleated sleeves and kilts, but it was the accessories, showing the real status and wealth of each individual. Belts, necklaces, bracelets, rings, collars, wig or crown decorations of the royals were made of gold and precious stones, crafted with the highest precision. Those who couldn't afford gold and gemstones, so almost the entire ancient Egyptian society, used colored pottery beads instead. By the way, in the Cairo Museum you can see the original gold calf bracelets worn by Ramesses III. Amun Herhebshev and Hemwaset are shown with the same hairstyle, a shaved head with a braided section of hair on one side. This is the side lock of youth, or the lock of Horus. The young form of Horus, son of Osiris, was always depicted with a short lock on the side. As the pharaoh was perceived as Horus in life, his children were wearing the lock, symbol of their connection with divinity and special place in the society. The lock would be shaven off after reaching adulthood. Though Hemwaset is depicted as a child in the tomb, he probably spent his entire life in the temple in Memphis, certainly outlived his father and reached adulthood. We know it thanks to a fragment of his coffin found by Schiaparelli in 1923, which bears the inscription of Ramesses IV and not Hemwaset's father, Ramesses III. Speaking about the coffins, the tomb when discovered included more than 40 wooden coffins from later periods, 22nd to 26th dynasty. It's my first time in the Valley of the Queens, and it's gonna be my favorite place or one of my favorite places in Egypt. Why? Because there's no tourists here. Just take a look, there's no one here. And moreover, there's no one for the camera. The next tomb, QB52, belongs to one of the wives of Ramesses III, Titi, probably mother of aforementioned princess, as well as her husband's successor, Ramesses IV. She was also a daughter of the founder of the 20th dynasty, Setnacht. Titi bore a lot of titles, queen, king's great wife, great royal wife, king's daughter, king's
King's sister, King's mother, King's great mother, and God's mother. This one is sadly in a very bad condition. But fortunately, we can identify some of the scenes, like this one in the side chamber where the queen is offering to the four sons of Horus, or here where the parade of the gods helped the queen to unite with the resurrected Osiris. Just looking at the size and the quality of decorations in the tomb, it's clear that the queen's position was of far lesser importance than the pharaoh's. Already the ancient Egyptian word for queen, Hamet Nesf, wife of the king, indicated her place, a consort of the divine being. Though from the very beginning of the pharaonic era, the position of the king had a full mythological background and advanced symbolism, the first title of the queen, the king's mother, and the first emblem, the vulture headdress, didn't appear until the Old Kingdom period. The first female to put her name in a cartouche was Princess Neferuptah daughter of the Middle Kingdom pharaoh Amenemhat III, but the cartouches of the queens didn't become widely used until the early New Kingdom period. Also then, the first mythological role of the queen appears. She starts to be associated with the female deities Tefnut and Hathor. And also during the New Kingdom, apart from the three main titles depicting rather the relationship to the king than queen's individual attributes, the king's great wife, the king's wife and the king's mother, she starts to be named Sweet of Love, Possessor of Charm and the one who fills the palace with the scent of her fragrance, as well as most importantly, God's Wife of Amun, which was actually name of the office finally allowing the queen to fully participate in the cult rituals, to own extensive land and to have an income. I'm fully aware that the most famous tomb in the valley belongs to the beloved wife of Ramesses the Great. But filming inside is strictly, and I mean strictly forbidden, not to mention that because of the humidity one is not allowed to stay longer in the tomb than 20 minutes. But you know me, I will definitely come back here. Still, I hope you enjoyed today's episode and learned as much as I did. And thank you for watching. To stay tuned, please tap the subscribe button and help my channel grow by commenting and sharing my content with your friends. And see you on another ancient site.